when you try and create the future, you look at what's currently the case, and extrapolate down the road the best that you can. Human progress tends to run very slowly in terms of our political activities, our emotions, our social structure, our evolution. 200 years isn't much of a difference. Technologically, you're looking at great progress over time. One of the first things we talked about was, well, is everything in the future going to be different than everything now? That was fun, creating the world of 250 years from now. Joe was very into all of that. He's been a science fiction writer for most of his life, and so he kind of led the parade. The main thing for me was to keep it realistic, to look at today's technology and say, okay, what logically might come down the road at us? The first kind of cornerstone that we laid was that human technology had to stay within the realm of physics as we understand physics and the way the universe works today. One thing that had been uh, current in my head from the beginning was to use O'Neill Station. We chose one of Gerald O'Neill's designs. He's one of the pioneers of space colonization. He came out with a book that was called The High Frontier, and it very compellingly made a case that we had the technology to put large space stations in orbit. The idea of this massive sort of cigar-shaped ship that was spinning on its own axis, and the idea that if you spun something of that kind of mass, you would generate your own gravity. One of the things that he also made a case for was having green belts. This was a new image for television because it provided a sense of expanse. When you are in space, the idea of having things that are green around you is very attractive. We tried to apply the, the question of what is real and what works, not just to the exterior, but the interior of the station as well. Every door on Babylon 5 was a guillotine type door where it came up and down, a jackknife door where it came in and swung from the side, or two doors that parted in the middle like sliding doors, or had different unusual ways of movement. Part of that was just to help make it seem foreign like an interesting place, and part of it looked like it was technology at work, it was the machine of the space station opening the doors. Often in the show, we had sort of breaches of the outer hull or where an explosion would happen. You really had to seal off an area, and you could do it very dramatically and very quickly, and with a big thud, you know, a metal, crushing metal kind of idea. And so that was really the inspiration for the guillotine and the swinging doors on the ship. You'd think you wouldn't have windows in a space station because you would think, well, they could break, and this would be like, well, bad. But I thought, well, for dramatic purposes, you want to have them. And the reality is, no matter how good our cameras are, there's something different to the eye about looking out and seeing something. The idea of a window onto space is at the heart of science fiction. I mean, after all, Babylon 5 is a window on the future. And so to have windows into space really gets, again, back to the idea of a space opera and the grandiose quality of it. In science fiction shows, you have the whole issue of FTL, faster than light travel. One of the most interesting ways of handling FTL travel is to use hyperspace. The idea of going into hyperspace was carefully discussed and studied by all of us. And of course, the use of the jump gates to get there was something that we expanded a great deal in the show. The jump gate generators were these massive devices that gave off tremendous amounts of energy, which was the whole crackling that went down and focused into a point where a ship could make a jump. And only certain ships were large enough to have jump engines as part of their complement of technology on board. Other vessels had to rely on these portals that were spotted periodically throughout the galaxy. This seemed to me to be the most logical way of doing it, but because hyperspace isn't our space, you have to decide, okay, how will you dramatize this? How will it look differently? Because if you make a jump and it looks like our space, you don't really buy that you're in, in a different area. I took the leap that uh, hyperspace was a more dangerous space, that there were fissures and uh, dangerous cloud areas racked with energy and lightning, and that there were things that perhaps lived in hyperspace. That was my way to get around the whole FTL question. It was a cheat, but the cheat does have some math behind it. When I decided to look at the question of battles in space. I knew that, tactically speaking, you want to have a variety of weapons available to you. You have your, your main asset surrounded by medium-sized ships. You would have fighters, but then what do those fighters look like? 
I sat down and said, could we hack up with something where pilots in the center of the ship, because of the rotational axis aspect of all this, with engines front, back, sideways, and top, so they can go forwards, backwards, spin, and is designed to function in zero gravity. You would have a second variety of these, which are meant to function both in zero G, non-atmosphere, and go down into an atmosphere, strike planetary targets. And that gave us the Star Furies we see normally and the Thunderbolts we see later on. Weapon wing is another interesting aspect of the world of Babylon 5. The problem with a laser is a laser is not very dramatic. When the laser fires, you don't see a little beam of light trace across to it. So we really wanted to come up with something that was a projectile, a burst, a plasma that gave us something that we could follow like a tracer bullet. So we came up with our plasma weapons on the Star Furies. The notion that these turrets on the ships would have to be counterweighted with some kind of thruster firing because they would shoot and they would like make the ship, you know, list. Actually, some of the shots wound up showing a lot of these things. The ships had a real great inertia when they crashed into one another and the pieces, you know, came off. But that's just me getting, you know, liking the shots. And then each one of our alien ships, they had weapons which were probably just too arcane for our poor little Earth minds to understand, that were also very powerful and nasty looking. The whole question of sound in space was one that the fans and I fought about endlessly. There were two sides to, even amongst ourselves, about sound in space. Uh, because here we are, we're, we're, we're dealing with the physics, and now we have to go to the next level of, okay, do we hear stuff? Finally, I sat down with some NASA guys and said, look, help me work this out. Now, there's no sound in space, correct? They said, well, technically speaking, correct. I said, well, I mean technically speaking, correct. Well, where there's an explosion, there is atmosphere inside the ship. So where that atmosphere bubble comes out, the sound will travel with it. Eventually, it'll disperse into nothingness. Also, there's a shock wave that comes away from the explosion, which if it hits a nearby ship, would register like ringing a bell. What we did, which some people never noticed, by the way, was if we knew that they were breathing an alternate atmosphere, we actually altered the color of the explosion accordingly. So if it's a methane atmosphere, what would the explosion look like? Would it be bluer, would it be greener? And we altered it accordingly. Babylon 5 is neither a pessimistic nor an optimistic view of the future. I don't believe we will solve all of our problems in 200 years. We haven't solved them in the last 6,000 years. We're not gonna solve them in 200. But it's important to say that our failings go on, but our nobilities also go on. We will carry into space with us our frailties, our foibles, our humor, and our nobility.